Yeah, we're so happy to see every single one of you in the house. As Tori mentioned, we are concluding this series that we've been in uh, for the month of January called Set Apart. And this series has been awesome. It's been amazing because in this series, we've truly been talking about what God's word says regarding who he is in our life and how our lives should respond to who he is. He is good. He is faithful. Time and time again, he proves just how wonderful and amazing and powerful and beautiful he is. And here on earth, we have the opportunity to get to know him every single day that we have on this side of eternity. We've been talking about that in this series. And I know that there have been many people who have just been so moved by the word of God that there's this hunger and this passion and desire to know more about this amazing God. Amen. And I just want to say if you're here and you're just beginning your journey of faith or whether you've been a Christian and a Christ follower your whole life, God wants to reveal his goodness to every single one of us tonight and every single day in new and unique and personal ways because that's how good our God is. He loves us. He sees us. He knows the things that we're going through and we're enduring. And despite all of that, he loves us anyway. And, you know, tonight we're going to be talking about a topic that I think resonates with many of us. We're going to be talking about what happens when we pass on this side of eternity, what happens when our lives end here on earth? Or what happens if Jesus comes and he returns and he restores the world to how God had originally created it? And if we were very honest with ourselves, there is something in us that wants to know more about what eternity is. It's not in your notes, but Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says this, God has placed eternity. Everyone say eternity. God has placed eternity in the human heart. That means woven into our lives, woven into our DNA, woven into the fabric of who we are. There is a desire to know what is out there. We crave this, this understanding of God. We crave his love. We crave who he is. Many of us, we grew up not knowing we need that love or that that love is available to us, that his holiness and goodness is something that we can experience every day through our relationship with Christ. But that's the reality. We crave the goodness of God. Because we were created to experience that goodness every single day. And the only thing that will fill that eternal void in our soul is the eternal God. And there's this reason why we grow up before Christ, perhaps. Trying to fill that need, that purpose, that desire for something bigger, grander, meaningful in our lives. With things like our notoriety, or our careers, or our education or our popularity, or our achievements, or our items and our possessions, and all of those things aren't bad, but all of those things are temporary. And if we try to fill the eternal and infinite void that God created in our soul with temporary things, we will be feeling like there's nothing in this world that can satisfy us, especially when we live in a fallen and broken world. It's not a bad world, but we see the effects of sin in our lives and the lives of other people every single day. So many of us, we come to know Jesus in the midst of us coming to an end of ourselves because, yes, we acknowledge that, man, Jesus is the answer. He is the way. He is the light. He is the truth. And when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, again, some of us for many years, some of us for just a few days, when we receive Jesus' love, something come alive in our soul and something feels so right. Especially in moments like this where we come and we worship together, right? Like, so good. It's like, I feel like the worship team picked my three favorite songs this evening. It was so good. I felt my soul come alive during this time of worship, just like many of us did. And it comes alive because we see the word of God and the people of God and the truth of God and the goodness of God just kind of wrapped into this four walls of this church. The reality is, God's word says the church is not a building. The church is his people. And here's the battle. When we leave a Sunday night service or when we leave our small groups or when we leave like our awesome devotion time before starting our day or before we get out of our car and start our time on campus or a time in our working place or before, before we go back home, we know for a fact it is a battle to live out in the holiness and the goodness of God when we leave places like this or spaces like this because of everything that we see. So because of the reality of living in a broken world and the reality that we know about this infinite, eternal God, our soul, our soul still craves more. And the reality is we will not be fully satisfied. We will not be fully at peace and rest. We will not fully be in a place of just completion until we see God face to face in heaven and eternity or if he comes to restore the world before we pass on this earth. That's the reality. 
And we can live life always feeling a little angsty, like, oh, God, just take me now because, man, like, life's tough. Or we can live with the promise of eternity that gives us hope today for what's to come tomorrow. And we can look at our lives, no matter if we're on the highest of highs, or maybe we're experiencing the lows of lows, or maybe we're just caught in the undertow of the in-between. No matter what we are going through, we can look at the promise of God and say, man, this minute, this hour, this month, this year, this decade, this century that I'm alive is worth living because the God who promised me tomorrow is giving me breath today. That is the God that we are going to be talking about tonight and the God that we should be talking about every day in our lives if we've come to know Christ. So we're going to be looking at a very interesting passage, a beautiful passage. I think it's one of those, like, books in the Bible. It's, it's the book of Revelations. And for some of us, we may be intimidated when we hear about the book of Revelations because the immediate thing we think about is the book about the end times and what's going to happen. And we're not going to be talking about the end times tonight. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is what the promise of what will happen, the promise of eternity, what that should mean for our lives today and the days to come. And again, we're going to be looking at this specific passage from Revelations that I think will give us a picture. And we're going to break, like we're just going to sit on this passage for this evening. And we're going to let the word of God come alive. I think it, not only is it a beautiful passage, it's a powerful passage. It's a vision that the apostle John saw of the coming of what is to be. The new heavens and the new earth. And it gave him so much hope. The Holy Spirit made it so important that it needed to be part of the Bible and we're going to be dissecting, eating it up, marinating on it tonight. And again, I think it's going to give us a lot of perspective and a lot of hope for our lives tonight. Amen. Turn to your neighbor tell them God's good. Revelations 21, 1 to 7. I say this all the time. I'm going to read this passage. I want to encourage every single one of us to like lock in, lean in, engage with the word of God. As much as we read the word, it wants to read us. It'll be up on screen. It'll be on your notes. Don't listen to my voice. Listen to the Spirit of God speaking to us as we read his word. Again, this is a vision about the times that are to come by the Apostle John. Revelation 21, 1 to 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4. God, make this specific verse come alive right now he will wipe every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away he who was seated on the throne said I am making everything new then he said write this down for these words are trustworthy and true he said to me it is done I am the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will bear their, be their God, and they will be my children. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, this is your word, and we humbly ask that your word would come alive as it is. We pray that your word would speak not just to our minds, it would speak to our soul. And just something in us regarding this idea of eternity, God, would feel right in us. God, I pray that every person here, whether we've been a Christian our whole lives or this is a very new thing, Lord, I pray that your word would reach us and speak to us in unique, profound, personal ways, Lord. And I pray every single one of us would leave here with a better perspective of what's to come because of the word that you gave us today. God, may it be yes and amen. Let it be so. God, speak to us this evening. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Number one in your notes goes like this. God's redemption is a promise rooted in his love to restore our lives. Everyone say love. Everyone say restore. God's redemption is a promise rooted in his love to restore our lives. Going back to Revelation 21 verses 1 to 2. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. First and foremost, I love the imagery. I love the poetry. I love the details to this passage because it gives us an understanding of what the new heavens and the new earth would be like. We're not going to dive deep into what does that actually mean and what is it going to look like and what is every step going to be like when it comes to pass. Like, I don't know. That's why it's in the book of Revelations. We're supposed to experience it when God is ready for us to experience it. But we have the word of God tonight in Revelations that gives us an insight on what this moment would be like when God in his loving goodness, in his holiness, would send the new heavens and new earth to not just be a thought to us, not just be an expectation for us, not to just be something we read in the word, but something we get to experience and live in and breathe in and step in every single day. It's coming. Again, it'll come if we pass on this side of eternity or God redeems and restores the world before that. But it's coming. And I love the imagery of how beautiful this moment is. Like when the new heavens and the new earth are coming, it's going to be like a bride on her wedding day dressed in white, in purity, in perfection. And we get to see that moment come to pass. When the new heavens and the new earth come, or whether or not we pass and we step into heaven's gates, it becoming our reality, the anticipation of watching it get closer and closer and closer, is supposed to be like how a husband sees his bride on his wedding day, that expectation, that excitement, that deep, immense joy and love and just something in their soul coming alive because something of my past, single life, without my bride, without my wife, is now going to change forever. I'm going to be married. New seasons, new things, new love, new everything. My old is going to be done and my new life is now going to begin and it's coming because my bride is coming to me. Just picture ourselves in that moment where we get to see the beginning of forever in our life. And how peaceful but yet so profound that moment would be. Like that is what is coming. This is what we read from Revelations. This is going to be a glorious and amazing day. You know, for me, uh, my wife and I, my wife is Chantel. Many of you know her. We've been married almost five years now. We'll make five years in June. We got married June 15th, 2019. And I want to show a photo of us on our wedding day. That is me and my wife. Pray for me. I'm believing that God would resurrect my jawline. It's true. Pray alongside of me. But this was us on our wedding day. And I just like, I was like, I was so excited. Like we got engaged in September 2018. And then we got married about whatever months after that would be when it was June the following year. And there was like this anticipation in me like, oh my God, like my life is going to be completely changed and transformed. Like my old life is going to be completely done and a new life is going to begin when I get to see and watch my bride walk down the aisle, aisle on our wedding day. Like there was just this anticipation, like I was just stoked and excited, but also nervous and like, what is life going to be? Like I didn't know, but I know that it was going to be good and I knew that it was coming my way and I knew that it was going to be something that would forever change my life for the better. doesn't mean marriage is always good and easy, but it means it's going to change our life for the better. And that is the reason why marriage becomes an example of the commitment and the love that God has for his church. Because the same kind of love that Jesus had to die for his or die for God's people, die for every single one of us to be sacrificial, to be loving, to be caring, to be kind, to do whatever it takes for the better of the church, which the Bible says is his bride, is how we as husbands are supposed to be when we receive our bride, whatever it takes for their good, for their love, for their lives. Marriage is a powerful example of God's commitment to us. And it deeply impacted my life. Like I remember on that day, some of you folks that have been married or know about marriage, like there's like that moment, right? Like the first look. Spend about like half your day getting ready for the first look. And really for the rest of the day, but that's like a monumental moment. Bride's getting ready. Groom's getting ready. Groom only takes about half an hour to get ready. The bride takes really all day. And it becomes a powerful moment where you get to meet one another for the first time. And the husband gets to see their bride. Like a little sneak peek before the actual ceremony. I remember we got married at the Prince right outside Ala Moana. And uh, our... First look was on the patio where we actually got married, but we, our first look was there. I remember, um, you know, like, my groomsmen walked me up, and I had to, like, keep my eyes closed, and then, like, 
you know, and this is just me kind of reenacting and memorizing or remembering the moment. And then, like, you know, there's the photographers and the videographers and, like, some of our family members and my groomsmen and the bridesmaids. And all I remember hearing as that moment was happening was, like, the, oh, oh, because Chantel was making her way. She was coming up and she was going to see me and I was going to see her. And I remember, like, we were kind of doing this thing. And then, like, that moment happened, right? First look, photographers, videographers, everyone's ready to capture the moment. And I looked at her. And I started crying immediately. So I looked away really quick. Like, it's in our video. Like, you can see it. I was like, oh, you know, like full on crying. Because I was so amazed by how beautiful she looked on that day. That she represented the end of a season of my life. And she also represented the beginning of my life that would be better because of her. And the marriage that we were going to experience. It was so funny because I'm all like weeping and then she's like, oh my God, you're already crying. Like, she was just like, oh my gosh. She just does that to me all the time. Always teases me because I'm the emotional one in our marriage, but it's true. Remember on our actual, like during the ceremony, Pastor Tim Ma did our, our wedding and he officiated our wedding and, and there was that moment, right, where like all the vows are done. And when you kind of listen to the vows of a wedding with like the lens of like, that's what God would do for us, ooh, just makes it come alive. But that moment finished, and then, of course, you know, the officiant says, you may now kiss your bride. And I remember, like, everyone says, like, kiss for five seconds. You have to do it for at least five seconds because everyone needs to be able to celebrate that moment. The pictures need to be taken. The video has to capture. It can't just be a quick peck, uh, peck and then leave. Like, you have to be in the moment for five seconds. I remember, like, we had our, you know, uh, kiss after the fish, uh, official, officiant was done with that moment. And I just remember an eruption of celebration. Like, yeah, yeah, woo kiss again you know like everyone's just so excited and every there's just so much celebration and here's the thing about what eternity will be like that moment that quick 10 to 12 seconds of everybody celebrating non-stop because of something new happening in our lives that 10 to 12 seconds that finished when it was done that 10 to 12 seconds will be every second every minute Every hour, every day, every week, every month, every decade, every century, forever and ever and ever and eternally. Like, that is how we're going to be in heaven. Where that celebration, the eruption of joy, the non-stop moments of just, wow, this is the best thing ever. It won't stop. Because heaven never ends and eternity never ends. And we celebrate what God is bringing us. What God is allowing us to step into. We celebrate and glorify the moment that we get to be with our God in heaven forever. He did it all for us. So that it didn't have to end after that 12 seconds were done. That is what we get to look forward to in heaven. That is what it means when the new heavens and the new earth are going to be our reality. A moment that we get to step into a new season that will never be anything less than constant worship, constant praise, constant glory to God. You'll still be able to get your coffee. You'll still be able to eat your acai bowl. Poke bowls will be even better in heaven. You'll probably still have a gym membership. All of those things are good. But the best thing about eternity is the celebration never ends. And if that doesn't give us hope for today, no matter what we may be facing, that we don't truly understand how good what God did for us in sending his son Jesus. And that's not a word that's supposed to condemn us. That's just a word for us to lean in a little bit more on what it means to be a Christ follower. It's more than just a Sunday night. It's more than just a good feeling. It's just more than a blessing or, or an answered prayer that one time I reached out to God. Our lives here on earth and the opportunities we have to live is for the glory of God and his holiness to be experienced in our lives, but also displayed through our lives as well. Amen. When the word says the new heavens and the new earth are coming, all that simply means is a celebration will never end. And the restoration of how our experience was supposed to be would be made right once and for all. Amen. Number two in your notes goes like this. God's redemption is a promise of a new world. Everyone say new world. God's redemption is a promise of a new world without sin. Verses 3 to 5 of Revelation 21. It'll be up on screen. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, 
God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. I'm going to read verse 4 and 5 again. Come on. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything. Everyone say everything. I'm making everything new. This is a significant part of this passage. In, I mean, the whole passage is significant. But for us, it's significant because it's part of point two, okay? We're going to dissect this a little bit more on what this passage means. We said this a little bit earlier. Many of us, we come to know Jesus because we've come to an end of ourselves. We're done dealing with our pain. We're done dealing with our brokenness. We're done dealing with our addictions and our greed or our manipulation, our anger, our pride, our jealousy. We're tired of being destructive in our lives. And guess what? Oftentimes we are tired of being destructive to other people. That is what sin does. Sin breaks our relationship with God and it breaks our relationship with people. And time and time again, we suffer in this world because of the consequences of sin. That's when many of us come to know Jesus. Because we realize, our soul realizes that what we're going through is wrong. And the things that we're trying to cope because of the things that we're going through is wrong too. It has to be something more. It has to be something more genuine, more real, more authentic. Something that never ends. It has to be Jesus. That's where many of us come to know Christ. We came to know Jesus because we were done trying to live life without him. We were done seeing the beautiful Eden that God created in Genesis. We were tired. We are tired of seeing it anything less than how he intended it to be. That's just the reality. Some of you guys know my testimony. I shared it a few times here tonight, but I have a photo of my grandfather. Put it up on the screen. It's my grandfather. This was 2002, I believe. This was one of my last photos I had with him. Grew up in a broken home. I love my parents to this day, and I'm believing that God would continue to move and and, and reveal his love to them. Like, it's been a 20-year process and journey of overcoming the things that I've been through to love and believe for my family to come to know Christ. Like, it's, it's a journey. But when I was in high school or middle school or actually just growing up, like, my life was tough. A lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, a lot of just things that were going on that made me question, like, God, do, do you even love me? Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you know what I'm going through? Like, even at a young age, as early as, like, four to five, I already knew something about my life wasn't right. I don't, I'm not resentful or angry towards my parents, but that was my reality growing up. And two of the people that I had in my life that allowed me to endure the things that I was going through was my grandfather and my grandmother. They were, like, everything. They were in my safe space. I loved them. They were awesome. They were amazing. My eighth grade year, my grandfather was diagnosed with lung cancer and um, began to see the effects of cancer and the treatments now start to take away his life. And like, this is my grandpa. This is everything to me. I'm slowly seeing like sin overwhelm and overtake his health and his well-being. Like disease is a consequence of sin. That was never how God intended our lives to be. We weren't supposed to experience all of the things in our lives that make us question our life and the goodness of our life and the God who gave us this life and his goodness as well. Like that was not supposed to be our experience, but it is for many of us. And that was mine. I remember in that year, because I kind of grew up knew, knowing of God and I would go to church and do all the religious things. And I told God, I was like, God, if you love me, you wouldn't take my grandfather. If you cared about me, you would heal him. I began to make negotiations with God. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. But if you don't, I won't. That was me coming to an end of myself with my situations and circumstances because three months after I prayed that prayer, my grandfather passed away. I actually got to see and witness my grandfather passing away right before my eyes. I literally saw his last breath. And I saw my family members that were surrounded him weeping and crying 
just overwhelmed with sadness and pain. And I was feeling all of those things too. And I was just like, how can this be the end of my grandfather's life? You ever feel that way? When you look at the things you're going through or the things that others are going through or things that people in our state are going through or our nation are going through or our world are going through and we question like, it just, it just, it's not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to end this way. See, the promise of eternity, the promise that God would wipe every tear from their eyes in eternity, that there would be no more death or mourning or crying or pain in eternity, that he is making everything new in eternity. That is supposed to give us perspective that even though that's now how he intended it to be, he is starting the redemption process. He is making a way for that to stop. He is making a way for his love to re be received by every single one of us and to be revealed to every one of us. He is doing his part as a loving God and a loving father to send his son so that we could have a way. That that wouldn't have to be the end. That, that would actually just be the beginning of something else, something good, everlasting and amazing. When we come to know Jesus Christ, our old life has passed, right? And that gives us hope while we are alive here on earth. But when we pass on this side of eternity, and when we understand about the promise of what that means for us, that makes tomorrow something in eternity to look forward to and have hope for. That gives us perspective today. Amen. And I just want to encourage you. Like, and I'm just saying, like, after I came to know Christ, God began to move. He allowed that moment, my grandfather's passing, and, like, the darkness that I was feeling because of it for the next six months to be the entryway for his glorious love like a bride coming closer and closer to me. Whatever we may be facing, whatever we may be going through, the things that we feel so brokenhearted and ashamed of, don't let the condemnation change your perspective. Let that lead you into relationship with Jesus. Amen. There's hope for every single one of us yet. God's not done. You're breathing. You're alive. You're here. God still has a plan and purpose for you to be fulfilled before eternity. Amen. A couple lines, though, from this, book, or this passage in Revelations that I want us to kind of read. Like in heaven, right, it says that there will be no more death. Or first, it says that he would wipe every tear from their eyes. Isn't that interesting to you? Like, you know, when we read the word, we should, you know, just kind of read it and just kind of be like, hmm, why? So I remember reading this passage one day. I was like, why would there be no more? Or why would Jesus have to wipe the tears from our eyes? If there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain and there's no more sin and we're in relationship with God, then why would he have to wipe the tears from our eyes? It doesn't make sense. Are we sad in heaven? Are we heartbroken in heaven? And sometimes when we think about the moments we cry without Jesus or separate from God, it's like tears of pain. And I remember reading this word and God was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to wipe the tears away because those are tears of joy. Do you hear me tonight? He's going to wipe away not tears of sorrow. When we're in heaven, he's going to wipe away the tears of joy because there is no pain anymore in heaven. There's only goodness. There's only light. There's only perfection. It's only how God had intended it to be for every single one of us. Experience his love and goodness every single day. And like, you know those moments where just, you're just so happy or you just had a good cry or you're just so happy to see a family member or a friend after it's been so long and you like cry your eyes out. But those weren't bad tears. Those were good tears. And something came alive when you were crying that way. And you're just so happy that you're crying. You're like, I'm so happy, but I'm crying. You know, like you're just having that moment because it's good. God says he would wipe the tears from our eyes because heaven is going to be so good. We're going to be so joyful that the tears just won't stop. Here's this other thing about God. God would wipe our tears. Think about that. God's big. We're small. That's what I assume at least. For this God who created the world and the universe, created everything that we have, for him to actually be able to wipe the tears from our eyes gives us an understanding of what heaven will be like. That we will be that personal with God. And he would be that personal to us. Because the only way this huge God would be able to wipe our tears. Because I'm only 5'5". Five, five, or 5'6". Five, I'm 5'6". Five, I'm only 5'6". The only way that this huge God 
big God, enormous God, glorious God, perfect God would be able to wipe my tears of joy away is if this God would have to kneel and look into my eyes and see my tears of joy and in his intimacy and in his love and desire to be in relationship with me, in his knowledge of me, in his closeness to me, in his loving embrace with me. The only way that this huge God would be able to wipe my tears away is if he came to me, knelt before me, looked into my eyes, engaged with me in that moment, probably talked a couple lines of faith and encouragement to me, reaffirmed that he loves me, reaffirmed me that this is good, reaffirmed me that he's proud of me. And when those tears of joy just streaming down my face, it'd be, hold up, let me wipe that for you. You know how powerful that is to know that in heaven, not only would we be crying tears of joy and just in worship and praise to God forever, but this God would kneel down to wipe our tears away. That he would be that close and personal to us. And the only reason why he will be is because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. He conquered sin and death. He overcame the grave. He lived the perfect life we were supposed to live and died the death that we deserve so that eternity wasn't just a pipe dream and God's holiness and goodness was just something that we thought about. He did all of those things so that for eternity, believers in Christ followers that receive Jesus as Lord and Savior could have that moment of immense joy, infinite joy and continued closeness to God. And the best part about this is we can actually feel that close to God today. Amen. We feel it when we carve out moments of our day to thank him and be grateful. We, carve, we feel those moments when we take time to pray and just receive the Father's love. We have those moments when we're sharing our faith with others or talking to others about what God is doing of our life. Like because of the eternal hope that Jesus has given us on this side of eternity, we can actually have those very moments that we will have in heaven here on earth. That's exciting to me. We felt that and experienced it. And I want to encourage us, lean into those moments because God is good. Amen. You know, on the Friday night service, I, I, preached a, I preached on Friday night, and we had a similar message, same thing. And there was a, a, a son, about 40 years old, but he, he came, and he wanted to talk to me after service. And he was sharing with me that his, grand, or his father had passed away. And this past Saturday, so the day after the Friday night service, at 3 p.m. on Saturday would be his, grand, or his father's funeral, or celebration of life, excuse me. Celebration of life. When we pass on earth and we know where we're going, it's a celebration of our life here and our life to come. But this was like what, like I was just like in the midst of almost crying because he said that his father for many, many weeks was kind of bedridden and unable to talk. Like he was just, just existing. Like it, it was really tough for him, tough for their family to see his father begin to pass away. And his father's a believer, so he knows Christ. But in the last few days of his life, and this is what he's, he heard from his, I think, granddaughter. So this gentleman's granddaughter. Might have been daughter. But anyway, she said that when she was looking at his, uh, her grandfather that day, or about three days before he had passed, she began to see her grandfather begin to smile. Like for the longest time, just no expression on his face. And then all of a sudden, he began to smile. And there would be moments in the room that they were in where his or her grandfather would lift up his hand and begin to wave. Like this is like what I heard this past Friday. He would begin to smile and wave at people in the room. Not even to the people who were in the room. Just as if people were in the room. And in those moments he was able to talk just a little bit. And he would tell people, I love you. You know what he was seeing? He was seeing new Jerusalem and the new heavens, eternity coming for him, Jesus walking closer. And instead of that moment being one of mourning, this gentleman, when he shared that with me, he said his family rejoiced. It was like what they needed to hear and know for this celebration of life to truly be a celebration of life because they actually got to see the consonants of their father change, grandfather change, because they had this inkling in their soul that he was stepping into eternity with Jesus. 
That means when we pass here on earth, it's not the end. It's not something that we should hang our heads over, although it's painful and sad, yes. But the promise of eternity means we can leave with a smile on our face and we can wave and be joyful because of what's to come. Amen? Turn to your neighbor, tell them eternity is going to be good. <laughs> Last point in your notes. God's redemption is a promise that is trustworthy and true. Everyone say trustworthy. Everyone say true. God's redemption is a promise that is trustworthy and true. Revelations 21 verses 5 to 7 as we bring things to a close tonight. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I love this. The Apostle John decided to make a statement that these words, this vision, this revelation of what is to come is trustworthy and true because God is trustworthy and true. Amen? When Jesus Christ, well, also, the reason why this message is called tetelestai, it is finished, is because tetelestai in Greek literally means it is finished. And here's this thing. When Jesus was on the cross and he conquered sin and death, it was finished. Everything in the past was gone. And now the opportunity for the newness of God wanted to do in our life through his son, Jesus Christ, could begin. It is finished. It is true. The prophecies of the Old Testament is coming to pass. Jesus did it. It is finished. I know some of us are like, man, if it's finished, then why is my life still hard? Why am I still going through things? Why is it still hard to follow Jesus? Sometimes a second after wanting to commit to following him. Why? The simple answer is because we're imperfect people. But God is still revealing his perfection through our lives here on earth. And here's this crazy tension following God. It literally is finished, but he is not done with our lives yet. When he died on the cross and conquered sin and death, he healed us. But every single day, we are being healed every moment. He made us whole, but we are still experiencing his wholeness every day. We experience his glory, but his glory is being made new every single day. There's a reason why God has given us grace through his son Jesus. It's so that every time we want to hang our heads down and give up, because it is finished, but I'm still suffering. Those are supposed to be moments where God's grace picks us up where we are and reminds us, son and daughter, keep going, because I am with you. And whether or not you see me face to face or I return, you can do it, you can make it, and I will be with you every step of the way. So this whole thing about eternity to come isn't supposed to be like, well, God, just take me now. This revelation of eternity gives us hope for our life here and changes our perspective, not just for us, but for those around us that are still suffering without the greatest answer to this world's problems, Jesus Christ. We need to understand that for ourselves in order for us to finish the race that God has marked out for us. To kind of like bring all of that uh, together is we're going to watch this video clip. It's an old video clip. It's a little grainy. The text is comic sense, okay? But it preaches. It's a video of Derek Redman. He was an Olympic uh, track athlete. And something happened on the field or the track where he popped his hamstring. And there's this moment. This was the Barcelona Olympics. He was running a flight, trying to make it to the finals. And his hamstring pops. And there's this moment in his suffering because he takes a knee. It's almost like he wants to give up. And there's this moment where the father's love reaches him so that he can finish the race. And I just want to encourage us when we're watching this video, don't just watch the imagery that you see on screen or the story that's going to be told or the song that's going to be playing with the video. Imagine your life through the lens of what God wants to reveal of how he wants to give us the Father's heart so that we can finish the race he's marked out for us here on earth until we get to see him in eternity. Amen? Take a look at this video.
troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit away. powerful. In Hebrews, it talks about how there is a cloud of witnesses in heaven that is cheering us on to finish the race marked out for us here on earth. All of heaven cheering us on. And just like how Derek Redmond's father just busted through the stadium security just so that he could be with his son who is in pain so that he could finish the race is the same way God is with us, that he saw the brokenness of this world. He saw the suffering we were going through. He saw us taking a knee in the race marked out for us. And he was tired of that. That wasn't his plan. So he sent his son Jesus so that we could feel the experience of a holy, loving God. Lift us up by his grace. Walk us until we are healed. And then watch us cross the line only to be received by his love once again. That's the kind of God that we have. That's the kind of hope we can have on earth and in our lifetime. But more importantly, 
that is the grace that is going to get us to the finish line until we get to see God and Jesus face to face in eternity. Amen. I don't care what you are going through. I don't care what you're experiencing. I do care, but I do know that God also wants to reveal that those things that we want to give up on are the very things that God wants to reveal his love in and through so that we don't give up. Don't condemn yourself. Don't look at your past or your current situations and say, God can't. All of heaven is saying God will. And all of the Bible says that he did. Because as it says in Greek, to tell us die, it is finished. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, as our worship team comes up, one final verse tonight. As I read this verse or this passage out of Philippians 3, 12 to 14, let this be the seal that God wants for every single one of us tonight. A call from the word of God. That yes, heaven is coming. Heaven is for real. But to keep on running and don't stop. Let this word speak to us. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read it one more time. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, we're going to have a moment with God tonight. Before we stand, Before we sing, our worship team is going to begin singing this song, You've Come. But before we stand personally, have a moment with God to give him thanks. To let him speak to you about how much he loves you, how proud he is of you. That he wants to be the God that meets you when you're on your knee and wipes your tears and calls you to stand and helps you continue living and breathing and moving into the plans and purposes on this side of eternity and to finish the race until eternity will come. Have a moment with God and when you're ready, you can stand and sing this song. But have the moment with God first and let this message and the word of God just marinate on your soul tonight. He's here, he's present. And he truly wants to be the God that lifts us up. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.